Okay. Okay. Good. So I'm just going to read us in. Beautiful background. I love it. We're trying to figure out my background. So we put this up. So while that we're works. figuring it out. Totally works. Oh, how did that pop up? That should not be popping up. Turn off. Okay. Um, okay. So hi, Lisa. It's Jana, and I'm here with Teresa Harding, who is someone I love, and I'm so excited to be um, having her on the podcast. So I'm going to get her read in and get us started. So three two, one. Hello and welcome to Oh My Health, There Is Hope. I'm your host, Jenna Short, and today I'm here with Teresa Harding. Teresa is an internationally acclaimed speaker, entrepreneur, and business strategist. One of her roles she is determined to break is the notion that monetary success must come at the expense of sympathy, morals, or values of any kind. And if you ask Teresa, not only can you be successful while you're maintaining your values and sympathy for others, but your internal values and morals, your desires to serve others and impact the world should be the driving force behind your success. Teresa believes very strongly that working towards success is of no value if it doesn't at the same time transform you into a better version of yourself, the version of yourself you were meant to become. And over the last decade, she has built her own global business with sales teams in 61 countries. And in that time, Teresa has mastered the strategies to streamline any business and how to convey those strategies to her clients in an easy to follow step-by-step -step plan. And for some of you who don't know, Teresa is one of my mentors who has taught me those exact values that I share in my business today. She has inspired me to show up better, do more, and serve others through my business. So, Teresa, I'm so excited to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so excited. I know. Um, I, I texted Jana before this, and I said, I feel like I just get to come play with my friend. <laughs> So for those of you who don't know, before Teresa shares her story, I met Teresa like almost 10 years ago, I think, nine years ago. Has it been that long? It's been that long. Oh. It's been that long. And um, she has mentored me for years. I have been a huge fan of hers because she knows how to put the heart and soul in your businesses. Making money, yeah, it's awesome. We have to make money, right, to keep up and serve more. But it's how you can do that by really showing up and putting yourself out there and connecting with those people and making real relationships. So thank you, Teresa, for all you've done for me. Thank you. And I, Jana's one of those people where she says I'm her mentor, but she, you have changed my life, Jana. And you guys know that. Those of you who listen, you listen because she's changing your life. <laughs> That's what it was like for me. So this is really special. Well, one of the things we ask you to do on the show is share a story of hope. And you have so many of them. So I'm <laughs> dying to know which one you're going to share because over <laughs> nine years, you've had some cr pretty incredible stories. So um, if you just want to take a few minutes and share your story of hope. And when I say a few minutes, you take as long as you need <laughs> because we want to hear it. Okay. So I thought long and hard about this because I thought, wow, I have really messed up my life in so many ways and so many times. <laughs> Which one do I share? And some of them are, you know, you guys know how it is. Sometimes it's things that are in your control that is kind of your fault and some things are out of your control. And so I, I decided to share this one and I thought, oh, do I need tissue? Uh, but I, and this is actually before I met Jana, I come from a family of 13 kids. There are 13 of us and it was awesome. We love it. We're all pretty passionate, intense people. And it was so much fun that I wanted to have 12 kids. I knew I was going to have 12 kids and I had my life planned out. You know how it is. You plan your whole life out and then it doesn't work like you planned. <laughs> but that was my plan. And I knew I didn't want to be so old when I had my oldest one or my youngest ones that I wouldn't be able to enjoy them. So I, I had it all planned out and I, and you know me, Jenna, so you can just imagine, I'm like, okay. And we, I did get married young. And so when I started planning it out, I'm thinking, okay, by the time I'm 35, I'm going to have them a year apart right at the beginning. And then I'm going to, I'm sure my body will need a break. So I'll have them a little farther apart. So I, I just had the whole plan. I was so excited and I love kids. And I just imagined this house full of children and we had three kids. Well, we had two kids right in a row. And so they were about a year apart, I think 13 months apart. And then my husband got cancer and we found out. So that was devastating enough. That was devastating. That was more devastating, but that's not the story I'm sharing right now. That was a really, really hard time. And, but he was 23 and because we were young, we found out that we would not be able to have any more kids probably. 
because of the, he was going to have to be on chemotherapy for months and months and months. They, they, I remember they took us to the hospital and they took an x-ray because he had a lump in his neck. And I remember looking at the x-ray when they brought it to us, I thought, oh, there must be different kinds of x-rays because this doesn't look like a normal one. It was completely white. You couldn't see anything, no bones, no black, nothing. It was all white. And the doctor said, do you see all that white stuff? And I'm, I'm kind of thinking, oh yeah, you know, I wonder what kind of x-ray this is. And they said, none of that is supposed to be there. So it was filling his whole chest cavity, it was everywhere. And so as you can imagine, that was a much harder thing, but I'm sharing the story of my dream about wanting to have more kids. And the doctor told us, you probably won't be able to have more children after this is over. And so I, of course, what mattered most is that he would be okay. But one of the things, the reason I wanted to share this one is because a lot of times people will act like the thing that matters to you isn't as big of a deal. Because one thing a lot of people said was, oh, at least Roger's okay. Yes. And for those of you who know us, um, we, we have the sweetest relationship. He is amazing. Certainly not perfect, but amazing. And I am perfect. No, I'm not. <laughs> but we have a we have a wonderful time and people are always asking us, they're like, oh my goodness, how do you guys stay so in love? Whatever. So just know it's a given that that was the harder trial, but people would say, well, at least you have Roger. And I remember after a while feeling like, yes, I'm very grateful, but it's not your job to tell me that. And I have a dream that was taken, ripped from me. And to me, 12 kids is a family. Two kids honestly didn't feel like a family. And for people who aren't used to that and obviously 13 is a ton, people think, oh, well, you're lucky that you have two. Yes, that's also true, but let me grieve. Let me grieve over the loss of my dream for a minute. And so I remember um, it, was, it was so hard that we wouldn't be able to have kids and we ended up trying in vitro. We did foster care so that we could be certified to adopt kids. And one thing after another kept not working. We, were, we did foster care, but then we would move to a different state or city and we had to re go through that whole process again of getting fingerprinted and you know, do the whole thing. So we did it like two, three, four times, I can't remember. So we had several foster kids in our home and I can remember when we went to go do the, um, the in vitro. Our family is very, I'm getting really personal. <laughs> Our family is very fertile. And so we have lots of kids. My brothers and sisters, anybody who could have a lot of kids has eight, nine, ten, because we just, we love it. And we had so much fun growing up. And so I figured this would work really well for me. Well, it did. And I, I have this thing where I felt like if we're going to be messing with this type of thing, then if any, any embryo, any that turn into embryos, those are living things. And I didn't want to just go, well, we'll just take what we want and throw the rest away. So I thought could, we could end up with like 20 kids or something. <laughs> so we were kind of discussing the whole morality of the whole thing. And, and obviously we did it. We feel fine about it. But these are questions that you don't think about. It's fine for everyone else. But when you go through it, you have to decide what you feel right about. And so I, um, we, I thought, you know what? I can handle five. I wanted to do eight, but I thought if we put five of the embryos inside of me, I can make sure they're healthy. I may have to be bed rest, but people have had octuplets. I'm, I, I, I'm not kidding. I was serious about this and it was my, it was my dream. And so I, we did this and then I remember having what for me was a very spiritual experience. I know that people have different belief systems, but we all have that intuition and whatever you want to call it. I, I remember having a time where it was a really powerful experience where I felt this feeling that was like, the best way I can describe it is as, as if someone was giving me a big hug, like they gave me like, and for me, that was God, like giving me a hug and letting me know, Teresa, this isn't going to work. This isn't your answer for you because all of the eggs took, we had like 23, they were all awesome. And they, we put five inside of me. And after I had that feeling one by one, all the ones in the freezer started like being non-viable and one by one inside of me, they started dying off. And so I knew that that was not the right answer. It was so hard because, you know, for someone else, no big deal. For me, that was a big deal. And it was devastating to feel like that's what I had wanted my whole life. 
And so what's, what's interesting is, you know, we, you go through these things and my husband and I, of course, got so much closer through the whole thing. Trials can either tear you apart or bring you closer. And so we chose to, and had to work hard to let it bring us closer. And then as, so we found out I was already pregnant with my third son. So we have three boys and you know them, they're amazing. I love them. They're not perfect either, but they're awesome. <laughs> and I remember, you know, it, it always was kind of a struggle because it just felt like five people in a home did not feel like enough people because when you grow up the way I did, it just felt weird. And so, of course, we grew into that. But what was interesting that I never expected is over the years, um, I, I'm particular, one of my gifts is psychology. I'm really good at psychology and I, I have a background in it. And I'm, so I'm, that helps me be very good at disciplining kids and whatever. So we ended up over the years having several parents have their child come live with us for a while, sometimes because the child was struggling and they wanted us to help or whatever. And these are people that were not family and some were family. And so it was a great, great honor to be trusted and have that trust given to us. So I was thinking through it the other day and I was thinking, wow, there were a lot of kids who have come to live with us that w I don't think that that would have happened if we had had so many kids. And then that leads me into my, um, like, what I'm doing for my business. I'll tell you right now, I would not be doing what I'm doing for my business. And I feel like in a way, this has become my family, that this big family that I always wanted and never had, but I would have never been in a position if my life had gone the way I planned that to, to be in a position to help change so many lives. And so it's been a powerful, powerful lesson for me that you just, you just don't know. And I thought, you know what? I, there, I have a favorite poem. Can I share it? Yes. Long, but it, it just shares what I feel about this. And it's about um, a weaving. So you have to let me know if you've heard it before. But it goes like this. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. <laughs> I cannot choose the colors. He weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God roll back the canvas and explain the reason why the dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand <laughs> as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. And so whatever whatever your belief system is, whatever your, you know, you, whether you believe in God or not, remember that we don't understand, but when we come to the, to later in the story, all of a sudden we go, wow, that was why I needed to learn that, or that may help me be ready for this. And I love what you're doing, Jenna, because it, people need hope. And especially today when things are hard and there is, there is always hope. You know, two of the things I took away from that is, first of all, you did get your gift. You have a house full of grandkids now. I know. <laughs> your house is filling up. And I had three boys and I got my girls. When they got married, I got my three girls. So, yes. Yes. It's so, it's totally definitely filling up. And the other thing that really stood out to me is that when people come into our lives, they come into our lives in a different season than us. And sometimes that season is joy. Sometimes they're going through grief. And it's not our place to tell them how to go through that, right? It's not our place to dismiss it. We have to like embrace what their season is and just love them through it. And I have had that happen to me when people are like, but you have, but be grateful for. And I totally yeah. am totally grateful for those things. But I'm also sad that I've lost something, a hope, a dream, whatever. And I'm entitled to that sadness. I don't live in it. I process it and move forward. But when we just, we don't hear it and we just count it as like, oh, you're, you should be so grateful for it. And we are, we're totally grateful yes. for that. But, but we're going through a season. I need a friend right now where I'm talking about yes. this because it's hard. Yes. 100%. And I got to tell you, we have a secret thing we call Roger. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you, because she's right about her husband. We call him the gentle giant because Aww. he doesn't talk a lot, but when he speaks, he commands listening, right? Because of the 
calm. He does because of the calm. He's so calm and peaceful with everything he sees, says that it's just, you receive it really well. And I just call he's a big man. <laughs> and like, what is he? Six foot something? Like he's yeah, tall. He's six five. <laughs> yes. And so he's uh, to me, a gentle giant. He's like that big powering that just this gentleness comes out of him. And he's amazing. He, you two are an amazing group, our team together, like Batman and Robin, but there's no Robin. <laughs> I know. Actually, we did dress up like Batman and Robin <laughs> at one of our events. I remember that. And your house is always like, you have an open door policy for people coming in. But I want to start talking about how those skills that you've learned from that I see you implementing that in your business. And by the way, I love the shift in your business. I love that you are mentoring people to make real relationships, like to really dive into opening up that, building that rapport and relationship with, with the people they're bringing into their business. To me, that is everything about, it's not just about customer service, right? It's about really caring and getting to know them so that when they come to you in a season, you recognize it and you give them that hug or you're like, it's okay, I'm here for you when you're, when you're ready. Like whatever you need, I'm here. And that's what you and Roger taught me in business is to have that loving open door to recognize that in people and to just show up the best I can. Yeah. Wow. That, that is really powerful because, and it means a lot to me that you say that because that is, that's what I care about. That's exactly what I want. People who know me and they hear my trainings different places I go. It's about, it's not about you. It's about them. It's about them. And um, in fact, I just did a training yesterday where I was talking with a group of entrepreneurs and I was saying, if you are even, when you're working with someone, if you are worried about what you look like or what they might be thinking about you in that moment, you are being selfish. You are not making it about them because if it really was all about them, you'd forget yourself. And it's okay because we're human and sometimes we're not always doing it right. But let's work toward getting to that place where when we're with someone, it's about them because we're, that's what we're there for. We're there to serve them. I, I got to tell you one of the exercises I used to do at convention when we would go, there's thousands of people, right? I would sit with my team in the big lobby where there's tons of people coming and going and they're buying stuff. And I asked them, I want you to look around and tell me who you wouldn't have talked to. Right as I said that, I kid you not, this guy with a beard down to his belly has, <laughs> and he's got the leathers on. It looked like he just got off the back of a Harley. I would cross the street if I had seen him somewhere else. And he's got two big bags full of product and he's walking with this big smile on his face. And I'm like, who probably wouldn't talk to him? <laughs> but when you look and you're judging what people are looking and you're not seeing what they actually need and how they want to connect. We're doing ourselves a disservice and them. We're missing a huge opportunity. So yeah. I would stand every year. I would stand there and I would look around at all the people passing me. Oh, no, I would never talk to them. They look too old. No, I would never talk to them. They look too sick. I would never talk to them. They don't look like they could do this. And I was misjudging because I'll tell you what, most of them were working around those very expensive bags. <laughs> right. Yes, I was misjudging them and not opening up to seeing like, their season, who they really are. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting is we all know this. We all, because we've all judged before, but when we start talking to someone that we have judged and start really getting to know them and trying to ask about their story. And the more we know about their story, the more we go, wow, you are strong. You are amazing. Like, how did you even do that? And, and you are at this place today after going through that. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. We just have this world. It's a symphony of people and we get to go explore it all. I love it. Well, one of the things we say about your story, like I literally have built my foundation on my story. And if you remember, I wouldn't tell it for years because yes. I thought, who wants to hear that? I don't want it to be about me. I remember the first time I met you, I'm like, I don't want to talk about my story. Because I remember, I remember I pushed. Yes. I pushed and I said, your story will change people's lives. The first time I told my story, I was on a stage and there was thousands, literally thousands of people there. And I only did because a friend asked me and I remember sweating and I couldn't, this was just a few <laughs> years ago and I couldn't wait to get off stage. And the stage director grabbed my arm and asked where I was going. And honestly, I was like, am I not done? She's like, no, you're done. You did great. There's a line of people. And I looked around the corner and there was this line of people waiting to meet with me because 
the story that you guys are holding inside of you. You might think it's stupid, nobody will relate to it, but it might be the miracle or the hope somebody else is waiting to hear. And so when you share that, it makes you relatable. It's, it's your kryptonite, right? This is my yeah. weakness. <laughs> and people have to know you're human and you got up to, I don't know how many times I've had to get knocked down and get back up. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for it, right? It's feedback. <laughs> Yeah, you touch a hot pot, you don't do it again because you got great feedback. Because you learned, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I want to know a little bit about what you're doing now. Okay. Oh my goodness, what I am doing now, I'm so excited about. So I had started one business and we grew it pretty big and it became a billion dollar business. That in and of itself. So we had mil, you know, 100 million, over $100 million in sales every single month in our business. And it was exciting. And we still do that business, but we are able to, we have office staff who take care of a lot of the day to day. So I, I'm taking much less time. You know, when you, when you do something a lot, you get to the point where you can do it by rope, you know? Even the presentations, the trainings that I did, I could do it in my sleep, you know? And it gets to a point where you're like, wow, I, I want to do more. So we're still doing that, but a lot of my stuff is recorded there. I mean, we're, we're growing probably faster now than we did at the beginning. And I'm not taking very much time doing that. But what I realized is because of what I learned from growing my first business, I had friends who were in a different industry who are, run successful businesses or they have successful careers and they would ask me questions. And I started, I would, I started getting, I would get excited. I would say, oh my goodness, okay, we need to do this and this. And what are you doing about this? I say, no, no, you stop doing that. Let's do that. And I started going through this process and I realized that the things I would teach them would change their business quickly, really fast. They would scale their profit margins. They would infiltrate new customer segments. They would totally start to like grow their business faster. And I thought, wow, I can keep helping people in this industry over here, but that's just one piece of the pie. There are other people out there who I could totally help. And so I, I started helping people more and more. It's turned into a full blown business and it's so much fun because I still make mistakes, but all the mistakes I made the first time helped me to get to better places quicker with this new business. And honestly, true principles are true no matter what. And so the principles are the same. And so we call ourselves the rule breakers because rule breakers are all about breaking old rules, creating new rules. We do not need to do things the way everyone tells us that we have to do them. We don't have to be like anyone else. We don't, there are so many ways that we break the rules and you want to know what, until you break the rules, you cannot break, you cannot um, break old records. You can't. And, you know, look at, um, the first person who beat the, the four minute mile, and they said it, what, it couldn't be done. Scientists, physiologists said the body cannot possibly do that. You would die if you did that. So for forever, nobody broke that record until one person broke it. They broke the rules. They broke the record. And guess what? Within days, the next person broke the record. As soon as you show people that it can be done, all of a sudden people start doing it. So we are the rule breakers and it's not about an attitude toward authority or, you know, a lot of people think rule breaking is, uh, you know, I got to be against the man or, you know, they kind of have this attitude. No, it's, it's an excitement about moving forward, get out of my way because I am not letting anything stop me from the thing that I was meant to contribute in this world. I love it. The biggest part of that is you create that plan. I had so many people come to me with these big dreams and I love dreams with a dream without a plan is just a dream. Yes. You can't have it sitting yes. out there. Right. But if yes. you go like, even I still do coaching, I still go to coaches. I still go to mentors mm -hmm. because how do I get out of my box? How do I get, how do I get more out there? Right. How do I learn more? How do I grow more? And so one of the things you're doing is setting up that plan for them. Like these are the steps yeah. you take to be successful. You, you want that dream. You've got to have a plan to get there. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things, one of the phrases that we use is step skipping strategies, because I, the more I work with people in the entrepreneurial world in general, whatever business they're doing, the more I realize there are so many skip steps that we can skip. People will say, for example, well, you know, I want to write a book. And so people talk about, okay, prepare to write your book. And you know, this year I'm going to write a book. Well, I started looking at that because I want to write my book. 
And I started looking into it and I thought it should not take that long. Mm -mm. And this is not, oh, I'm amazing. So it doesn't take long for me. This is, I'm always looking at, because I, I train people, I coach people, I, you know, I mentor people all over the, I've, I've um, trained hundreds of thousands of people. So I'm constantly looking, not just, will this work for me? It's a, it's without even thinking that now, I think I look at it and go, how could I, how could I help the lowest common denominator? Not meaning that someone is the lowest common denominator, but maybe their skill level in that area is the lowest common denominator. So will it work for them? Because if it won't work for them, we haven't, we haven't created a brilliant step-by-step -step process yet. So I thought, you know what, based on what I know about business and about these steps, we should be able, we should be able to write a book in a week. And so I went through the process myself, actually the week before Christmas, I went away to Mexico for a week and it wasn't like 12, 15 hour days, it was eight hour days. And in less than seven days, I wrote my book. And it is right now, it's, I think, 70,000 words. So it's not a short book. And I, I've never done it before. And I was slower at the beginning. This was, it's, and as I was going through the process, my mind is going, how can I teach other people to do this? This is not something that you have to take a year or five years to create your book because that's what everybody says. So I do step skipping strategies where I look at the process. I, you know, I, people come to me with their business or um, with the, what they want to start with their business. We look at some things and I, I quickly help them get to a place where these are the steps to take and they can get very, there very quickly. And if they need to scale their business, we do the same thing. So I love exciting. it. I love it. I love helping people. And when they achieve the thing or they do like, how do you create an online course? For example, most people take a long time. I, I now teach people how to do that in less than seven days. Do most of your um, clients, are they online businesses? Or are they out on like brick and mortar? Are they building um, marketing companies? Some of both, more online for sure. I would say more online businesses, but a, a, a lot of them are, they have, they're trying to go online. They, I would say they're online because that's what they're trying to do, but they may have something that they do brick and mortar, or maybe they're uh, like, I work with one guy who is a psychologist who has a training that he has created that is becoming renowned around the world. And he just finished his book, but he wants to change more lives. He realizes that just lecturing to all the people around the world who are in his field isn't going to get this out to the people, to everyone who needs it. And he knows he can change lives. So I'm showing it, I'm walking him through that process and he's all, how do we do this this fast? And I kind of, I'll give him timelines and he'll say, like, I only have an hour to do that. I'm like, yeah, just do it like this and just only give yourself an hour. Just see what you can get to at the end of the hour. And he created this amazing amount of exactly what we needed in a short time. And so it's exciting because now if I can, if I help someone create something, let's say you want to create a course or you want to write a book or something, you want to launch your business. If I help, if I help someone do that and they can only do it at that level, if I'm there helping them, then I'm not really helping them. I'm giving them a fish. I'm not really teaching them to fish. But if I can do it in a way that I help them understand the process where they start to get it and they can do it at that speed or at that level without, and I'm not talking, oh, hurry, hurry. This is, I mean, I'm an intense person, but this isn't because we have to go fast. It's more because like I figure out ways to do it with way less effort, way less effort and way less time. And so that's what I do. What are some of the problems that you solve for them besides making that plan? So for instance, what would you say was one thing that people who are starting a business are doing maybe not act? I don't like to say wrong ways because to me, there's no wrong. There's no failure. There's no mistakes. Right. It's literally feedback. We were meant to have that mistake in our life yes, I, so I, that I, we can do something better with it. Yes. But what do you think the one thing they can miss doing <laughs> right away? Well, actually, I'm going to cheat and do two things. Okay? okay, There's one before they even start or, well, and then this carries through. But I probably spend 80% of my time with my clients on limiting beliefs. Mm. Don't necessarily call it that. And some of these are pretty high-end clients and they are paying a lot of money. And I still, it's, it's amazing how that is such a thing. And uh, sometimes depending on how it's exhibiting and how it's you know, coming out, we all call it imposter syndrome. I'm sure you've heard of that before. So it's when you look at it and you go, 
who, who do I think I am? I don't like, I'm acting like I'm going to teach this and I don't really even know, or I don't know enough or other people know more than me. They're going to find me out. Any of those thoughts means you have imposter syndrome. And I would say that is probably the number one biggest mistake that people make get over it. And I'll tell you something that maybe helped me, that helped me get over it, that maybe will help you. And it's when I was, you know, I knew I was leaving New Mexico. I was going to write my book in a week. And I, um, I started watching some videos because now I'm chicken. Now I'm starting to go, okay, I'm, I'm thinking I can do this in a week. And like, I you know, as I'm kind of nervous, I'm looking up videos on YouTube to how do you write a book? <laughs> that kind of thing. And so, cause I hadn't done it before. And I, I got this one guy who had written a couple hundred books and he was telling, he was giving some steps of this is how you write a book. And it was really good. And he wasn't even telling this. He was just giving some concepts about what he was teaching. But in the process of it, at one point, he said something like this. He said, he said, and so, you know, that feeling. And if you have that feeling that who do I think I am that I can write a book? Like, I don't know enough or whatever. He said, well, that's, that's just normal. You're going to have that through the whole process. And I remember thinking, what? You've written 200 books. You still have that? And so I feel like that was kind of a tender mercy that I saw that because when I was writing my book, and you guys, I have spoken in front of tens of thousands of people, audiences of over 30,000. So I, I'm, you know, I'm not scared of stuff. I've kind of gotten over those things and I, I love doing that. And so writing a book, I start writing the book and I'm trying to decide how I'm going to start it. First few paragraphs, literally I'm thinking, and Jana, Jana knows this about me. Nothing is impossible. Like, no, you say something is impossible. I almost want to gag. Like I can hardly even stand that. I was sitting there, this person who always thinks like this, I'm thinking, who do I think I am? I can write a book. I'm like, Oh, that's what he said. He said I would feel this way. <laughs> and so then it helped because then I real instead of letting that get to me, I realized, oh, this is exactly what's supposed to happen. And so I expected it through the process and I continued to write anyway. And so the trick is you want to feel the fear or feel that feeling and then do it anyway. And I'll say one last thing about that because I think people misunderstand failure. They people think I either failed. I went down this road and I failed, or I went down this other road and I succeeded. That's not what it's like. If you were to see the road sign, the road sign for failure and success is they're both pointing in the same direction. And what people don't understand about failure is failure is simply you figuring out another way that didn't work. If there are a thousand ways that don't work, like the light bulb, we hear about how he, he, he says, I didn't fail a thousand times. It was a thousand steps. To figure out the light bulb so you just did one of the steps you just figured out something else that didn't work and here we go now there are only 999 left eventually you're going to get to the one and maybe you'll get to it before you maybe that won't be the last one you try but if you if people really understood failure they would go yes i did it again because now i'm one step closer so so that's one thing and then so maybe uh, like do you have anything you want to say about that? Or maybe I don't know if I know that's I, by the way, I tell the light bulb story all the time. And I just do want to say something about imposter syndrome. I don't, I hear that all the time with my clients coming to me. I don't want to have imposter syndrome. It's, it's dreaming. It's not like I say I'm a plastic surgeon. I start doing brain surgery. I say right. I want to be somewhere. I start thinking it, living it, projecting it out there, you know, moving towards it. So there's no such thing to me as imposter syndrome. I, like, I love that you're, you're a dreamer, not an imposter. This is where you want to go. Now let's make a plan to get you there. That's exactly right. And if you know this much, tiny bit, then that's what you share. And that's how you change people's lives. And as you know more, then that's what you share. And that's what you teach. I love I it. What's number two? Okay. So let me make sure I remember the question because I was going on and on. Two so, things you would skip moving, starting a new business that you- Okay. Okay. You want to call them failures or mistakes. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So what I would do is rather than, and just so you, I, I, let me preface it with this. You, it's always best to jump in and start doing, to start doing. And then you learn as you go. The people who wait till it's perfect, they, if they don't quit, they'll still be successful. They'll just be successful way slower. And so I, I'm not saying don't jump in, jump, start doing, start doing and jump in. 
But the minute you jump in, start looking at this. What is everybody doing? Like what are, you, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. So look at what the successful people are doing that have already achieved what you're trying to achieve. And just because they ran the five minute mile doesn't mean there still isn't a four minute mile. I don't care how much they're your mentor or how amazing they are. So you look at the steps and what most people don't do is they don't break down the steps. They go, oh, wow, they got here. And they might think, well, there are four things you need to do. Take a minute, literally just sit down for just a half hour uninterrupted and go, what are the steps to do that? And you might not know them all yet. That's okay. You'll figure out as you go, but you'll, you'll, let's say you, it's four steps. Let's say it's six or 10, whatever that looks like. Look at those steps and go, which ones are not necessary? For example, you might say, well, I want to grow my audience on social media. So first I have to post a lot and, and kind of get the word out there and get to be known. When I get a little bit bigger, then I can start collaborating with other influencers who are maybe my size, maybe a little bit bigger. And then as I get bigger, I can work with bigger and bigger collaborators or influencers. So you can imagine this is sort of the mindset, even though we don't necessarily think it out loud. That's kind of what we're thinking inside. Look at those steps because when you write them down, you then you'll go, why do I need to wait till I'm bigger before I talk to influencers? Why does that even matter? It doesn't. And actually, I'll, I'll contact a bunch of influencers, find out what I can offer to their audience that would be amazing and not try to take anything. And then all of a sudden, you've got a, a press tour that you are going on with a lot of people and it's amazing. So look at the, really write down the steps. Even if you feel silly and you think, I don't really know all the steps, write down the ones you know of and then decide how, what can I change about that one? Do I even need that one? Get that one out of here. You will be shocked at how quickly you can get to where you're trying to go. Well, one of the things I will add to that is when we go online and we start our businesses or wherever we're starting our businesses, we make the mistake of not investing in ourselves. And oh, I went to experts, yeah. right? I went to experts and I hired them to educate me, to train me, to make me yes. better. But you definitely want to start investing in your business. It's like getting a car dealership and you're going to run it out of your home. You're going to invite people over to look at <laughs> photos, right? Because you didn't want to invest in a, a lot in cars and you can't test drive this. But if you go to the lot down the road, come back, I'm going to sell you the same thing. <laughs> you got to invest in your business, right? Trust in yourself and invest in yourself and go to coaches like Teresa and learn how to create things in a really amazing way because she's done it. She's done it multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and one of the things I, I agree with what you said earlier today about how, like, I will not be without a coach. Yeah, me either. It's just, I, there's not enough time. I want to, I don't want to spend 10 years doing what I could do in one year if I have the right mentors. And when you know how to do it right, you get to change people's lives and money is simply a trade in value. That's all. If I add value and someone tr feels that that's worth this amount of money, they'll trade that value and you are changing their life. And so for me, it's, it's never about the money, but a money is a way that we track. And so honestly, for me, it's how many people who have bought my package that's all about how many lives I've changed. I can't tell you how exciting it is when I have someone who has gone through a course of whatever and they, they do the thing and they finish and they're like, oh my goodness, I've been working on this for five years and I just got it done, you know, whatever. It's so, you know, Jenna. Right. Yeah. I have taken Teresa's courses. As a matter of fact, I went to Prague to take one of her oh, courses. Oh, that's right. <laughs> because it was so phenomenal. And literally, I came back a different person. So Prague for me was blew off the doors in what I learned about myself and how I wanted to show up and serve people. So I highly recommend Teresa's training. Oh. Teresa, how can people find you if they want to connect and learn more about you? Okay, let's see. I have, I actually have a special gift for your audience as well. A free master class that I want to give to them. So um, the place they can go for that is go to TeresaHarding.com. That's my website. And Teresa has no H. So T-E-R-E-S-A Harding, H-A-R-D-I-N-G.com slash masterclass. Okay. And you will find that there. And I'm excited to give that to you for free. One of the thing, um, one of the options that people can choose is one that's called um, 
oh, I can't remember, it's sassy, but it's something like, start your business already. For those of you who have like been holding back or you're worried if you don't enough or whatever, I thought, you know what, there's always hope. It is awesome. So that's one thing. And then of course we have, we have my Instagram. So if you look up Teresa Harding Official and my Facebook, and for those of you who know about Clubhouse, get on Clubhouse right now. Come follow me because that's all free training. And I have my, my TV channel on YouTube and my Instagram channel. So what maybe what I'll do, is it easier if I just... Well, I'll, we'll put I'll all of those links in the notes, show me. notes. Okay, perfect. So everything will be in the show notes so that when people are listening on YouTube or on the, um, the podcast channels, they can just click right into it. Okay, perfect, perfect. And I'm telling you guys, you, you do not let Jana go. You hold on to her. She is the real deal. You know, people become influencers. She's been on the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine. I'm so, so proud to and honored to be associated with Jana. And I will just tell you, she's the real deal. You know how you, you hear stories about some people who are like famous people and maybe they're not super nice in real life or they're whatever. Jana's the real deal. She has no guile in her and is the most loving service oriented person. I, I love, I love you, Jana. Thank you. You can, you come on every day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Teresa. And I feel the same way about you. Like she called or text me, said she was nervous. Like you're nervous. Hag, you're my mentor. <laughs> so Thank you so much for being on the show today, Teresa. I, all right. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me.